Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Core Discovery 2 and the Ten of Many Voices. And true to its name, the Ten of Many Voices lends itself to allow a lot of different presenters to come in and present different aspects of the Lewis and Clark Expedition and things that have happened since the Lewis and Clark Expedition. So this is the bicentennial commemoration, 200 years since Lewis and Clark and the members of the expedition passed through here. And so every hour we have a different presenter. And this afternoon we have Pete, John, and Tom Fredericks. So I'm going to let them identify who they are. So Pete, raise your hand. John, raise your hand. And Tom, there you go. And they are Mandan Hidatsa. They're going to speak with us this afternoon about horses, cowboys, and Indians. And just to give you some affiliation, on the end down here, these are ranchers from Twin Buttes. And this gentleman right here keeps them out of trouble. He's an attorney from Colorado. So please welcome the Frederick brothers and their presentation. Thank you. Uh, no. She left one out. Uh, we're uh, members of three affiliated tribes. It's Mandan Hidatsa and Rickerov. My mother was raised by the Rickerovs, and she's, uh, we were actually our Mandan Hidatsa. But we were raised by, the, my mom was raised by the Rickerovs, so we claim them too. Um, our theme is uh, Cowboys, Indians, and Rodeo. And mine is, uh, I'm going to do one on Indian Rodeo. So I'm, I'm an Indian, and I'm, I've been rodeoing, and I rodeoed all my life. So I'm going to talk about that. Talk about kind of myself. I don't want, I don't believe to be any be better than anybody else, but God gave me a gift in the rodeo. And so I mean, it's not like I'm bragging, but I'm not. I'm just telling you how it is. That's the way it was. And my, I'm, I'm a member of three affiliated tribes, like I told you, but I also have an Indian name, and my, name, my Indian name is Charging Eagle. I get that name through, through my Mandan culture. It's uh, my grandfather's name was uh, Charlie Grant, Char Char excuse me, Charlie Burr. And he was, uh, Charging Eagle was a brother to, to Four Bears, one of our Indian chiefs. Anyway, to make it, to get along with the story, I, I started rodeoing with, uh, with the kids on, in Round Elb Woods back in the early days in the 50s. And I, uh, we went, we used to go to little rodeos around the reservation there different places like the Chase had a had arena and, and up in uh, in the Joey and Chargin had an arena. We had about four arenas on the reservation. And we could go to each one of those and the practice it like early April. And that's kinda how I got my start. And in nineteen fifty three my my cousin Billy Hall Junior and Esley Thornton Sr. and Angus Fox qualified for the National High School Rodeo out of Beulah. And we went to, to Beulah and, and uh, I won the saddle bronc riding and, and, uh, and Angus won the bareback riding and uh, Esley won the bull riding. So we got to enter the, the National High School Rodeo in, which was held in Rapid City, South Dakota in 1953. In 1953, we, <clears throat> we had to send our uh, applications down to the, uh, the rodeo secretary at the National High School Rodeo in, in Rapid City. So, Esty and uh, move that. Give Billy me, were, give me that so were uh, from Elba Woods. They lived there in Elba Woods. And I lived up by Twin Buttes. I rode a bus to school, see. So, so I sent my uh, application in from Halliday, from the bank there in Halliday, and they. They sent theirs, and we had to get our our, our uh, applications notarized. And when we got down to the rodeo, we, would, we drove all the way down there in '53, and it, all there was was gravel roads all the way. And we got down there, and and Esley and and Jake weren't even entered. They threw their entry out because they weren't notarized. And I was the only one that left. They left in it, but I had me in the bull riding instead of saddle bronc riding. 
So <laughs> uh, I was in bare back and saddle, <coughs> and, uh, and I uh, went back and checked the bulls right away, and they were sure enough big bulls, you know. <laughs> I, I like I was a freshman in high school, so I was pretty worried about that. And I tried to get out of it, and they said, "No, we we take you out of the." See, my specialty was bareback anyway, but they had me in that one. My other event was saddle bronc, but they didn't have me in that. They had me in bull riding. So I I pleaded with them and tried to get them to take me out. They wouldn't do it. They said, you, "If you take you out of one, you're out of it completely." They said so. I stayed in, and I got on my first bareback horse there at the. Nationals, and uh, we only got one because there were so many contestants from all over the country in the United States and Canada. And, uh, and so Jake, Billy Hall Jr., and Espy Thornton Sr., they helped me down on my horse. And when I got down on my horse, I was, I was pretty nervous because the horse they told me was wrong to help, the, sh the shoot help, and the producer said that horse had never ridden before. I, don't, I didn't know whether they were trying to scare me or just. So I, I was pretty worried. He was sure enough. He's a shoot fighter, and he clawing the front of the shoot, you know. And I, and of course, that's the, he got right up there, and he, and I, uh, I remember could hear my uh, spurs jingling. <laughs> I was so scared. Was, and, and luck would have it when the horse jumped out of there. He was, I don't know. The Lord must have been on my side that day. I made a good ride, and, and I went to the lead in the bareback riding. And, held the lead all the way through and won the National High School Bareback Riding Championship. And I was pretty happy. And uh, the three of us, <coughs> we pooled our money and went to Custer, South Dakota. We thought we'd needed some money to get back on. We just had enough entry to enter or either go back home. So they wanted to ride these other, my cousins and my uh, my best friend there. He was, was my, uh, he was engaged to uh, my first cousin, Audrey Hall. So. So we all were together, you know, we went over to the Custer and, and sure enough, Esty got into Saddle Bronc and Bareback and I entered the Bareback and Saddle Bronc and Jake one rode Bareback, that's entered Bareback and and uh, we we didn't have very good horses, Esty and I. And and sure enough, Jake won second in the Bareback ride and there was only one header there too, so so he had enough money to get us home. <laughs> Jake Hall. So we we came back home. Jake Hall. Jake Hall, yeah, Billy Hall. Jake Hall is the name. Yeah. And then uh, then I went we went to uh, another one in high school. I went to the National High School Rodeo, and and when I was a senior year, they fit in '54. It was too far away. It was way down in Texas somewhere, so I didn't even bother to go. But I did go to the one in uh, Nebraska. It wasn't too far away, so at '55, I went to it, and. Uh, Angus qualified for it too. Yes, his brother Angus, and uh, we got down there, and sure enough, we had a pretty good team together. The North Dakota team was there was uh, Don Rain from Hebron, and I had a horse that I pulled down there. And uh, before I went, my uh, my old my old horse trailer was so beat up; it looked pretty shabby. So my, my sister. My, and my mother, they fixed it up, and my mom made me a good shirt, but she went to put the uh, the buttons on the wrong side, but I didn't make any difference. <laughs> I got down there, and, uh, and uh, we were entered in the right events. We made sure everything was right this time, around 55, and uh, came to the last horse, and I had a bareback and a saddle bronc, and I was in the steer wrestling, and I pulled it. Pulled my horse down there. I got from my brother Buzz, and I split split that horse. We we bought him out of New Mexico. My brother was in uh, Las Cruces, going to school down there, working on his degree. And so I hauled, I pulled him down there with Dad's car. And I remember I drove halfway down there, and I got tired, so I just pulled into some farmyard, somebody's farm along the road, and pretty close, but I went close to the trees. And so I let my horse eat. I had a little hay along for him, and, and I slept in the back of the car. I was by myself too. But then I got up the next morning, and drove on into Harrison, Nebraska. And then when we got to the rodeo there. Well, I was, like I was saying, I was in the bareback and saddle bronc. So I, I rode my bareback and and I rode my run my steer. And then 
And in, in, the, in the end, we were uh, neck and neck for the all around. It was my one of my teammates, saddle, a saddle bronc rider, Angus Fox, was right behind me, it was between me and him for the all around. Of course, we all wanted to win the all around because they gave a big horse trade away, you know, and all the prizes was in the all around. And so I, uh, I come out uh, third in the bareback and third in the steer wrestling. And Don Rain won the bare steer wrestling with a five flat. I was five three. And then somebody moved me down to third, five, two. But he won the steer wrestling, and, and I won the saddle bronc riding. And I also won third in the bareback riding, so that gave me the all around. So I did get the trailer. So I just left my old funny horse trailer sitting there, <laughs> loaded blue up in a new, new horse trailer, and brought him home. <laughs> and uh, we got home, and then uh, that following winter, uh, 1955, we had uh, an old guy, uh, back in the old days, they uh, had a, uh, a little, uh, little, little paper there at Twin Buttes that they call it uh, USSR, and, and the editor was John Starr Sr. And he seen all our publicity that we were getting. See, I not, I not only won that, but my, 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 my first cousin, Joe Chase, was also in college down in Texas, or in Oklahoma, and he won the saddle bronc riding in 52 and 53. So we were getting all that publicity, so he dubbed that the home of the champions. So Twin Buttes is known as home of the champions. We had three national championships, no, five national championships between the two of us. He had two in saddle bronc, and I had, I had a bareback title in 53, and a all around in 55 in the saddle bronc. So we had five national championships so we it was it was dubbed uh, home of the champions after that so they got a sign on to and you see ever go there well they'll see that anyway they went on through that and then i went into college and i had a pretty fair career in college now i i gotta hurry along now because i get my brothers here's got it they get 15 minutes it's already 20 minutes so. <laughs> they haven't even got out of college yet <laughs> <laughs> Well, to make a, a, a long story short, my mom told me, she said, whenever you do something good, son, and my dad said the same thing, they were together, and they said, when you do something good, you will give it back to wh whomever you're, you got it from, try to give something back. So I went to college, and I was doing pretty good in college, so I transferred up to Dickinson, and I thought, well, I, we don't have a, a Dickinson college rodeo team. So I brought my articles and corporation from, uh, from down to Mexico where my brother was, I went with him in the first year. So my second year I went to, in 1958, I went to Dickinson State Teachers College and I organized the rodeo team there. And so I, I was doing what my mom said to do and I was also helping myself to be close to home in the rodeo in college. And I ended up having a pretty fair I never did win a world championship, a national championship in college, but I was runner-up in 58, 57, to the all-around. And then into, into a, I graduated out of the college ranks and, and went into NFR, National Finals Rodeo, of the Professional Rodeo Association. They made us all, you know, if you got so far along in rodeo, well, you had to give by a card, and that was kind of the rule of thumb if you they wouldn't let you into these rodeos unless you had a PRSA card. And they had their own own association. So we, so I went to, then I through the NFR. I uh, they go by the top 15 to go to the finals. So they keep track of your points. They got a point system. Colorado Springs, they oppose most of you know how that works. Anyway, uh, I I qualified in two events in '61. I actually didn't qualify in the saddle bronc in uh, 61, but I didn't want to make the, actually make two events because we knew I knew that they had the, all this rank stock down there, and, they, and I found out that you had to get get on two head a day on the weekends, <coughs> and it was, it was just over five days. Of course, now they got a little stressed over ten days, but then then I went ahead and rode in that, and uh, was, uh, I was I. I was ranked uh, eighth going in in the bareback riding, and when I came out of the finals in Dallas, Texas in 1961, 
I was ranked fourth. So I ended up fourth for the world. Got beat out by 1,500, no, 3,500 points. Each dollar accounts for a point. $3,500. During the past summer of 61, I had a horse stop on, on me at Cheyenne in the finals and one that stopped on me at Salinas. And that, that particular year, they wouldn't give you any re rides under any circumstances. So I lost out on that. <laughs> that could probably cost me maybe you know, a championship. Anyway, I went through, through the professional rodeo, and then I went into an Indian rodeo after that. I was kind of through with that. So I went back into the Indian. I, and, and while I was in my professional career, I went to a rodeo, an Indian rodeo in Gallup, New Mexico. And, Gosh, uh, I was really saddened by the way the Indians were treated, especially the rodeo guys. You know, they just weren't treated right, I didn't think. So I, I thought to myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up this deal and see if I could straighten it out. So I got with the right guys. I knew the guys that I rodeoed with that was on the, in the, uh, the, they were on the board of directors. So I, I got them to pass a ruling that they wouldn't, they could let, the Indian rodeo be managed and helped with professional PRCA stock and officials. So I got that portion done and then went into the Indian, Indian rodeo stuff. We developed our, 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 all our or organizations throughout the United States and Canada. And we have, I think, let's see, 13 associations and they're all for themselves, each one, but we take the top two at the National Final Rodeo. So we, we dubbed it the International Final Rodeo, and it exists today as our finals are in uh, uh, San Luis. They're in San... San Carlos. San Carlos, Arizona at the San... at the uh, Gold Casino. Golden, so, Golden Globe Casino? Or something? Yeah, it's the Gold... Uh, the Gold... It's a gold casino of the uh, Arizona Apaches there in, in, uh, in Arizona, anyway. So it's on the 19th through the 23rd, if anybody wants to go. It's a good rodeo now. With that, I'll let you, uh, I'll better end it so my brothers don't kill me here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bad ending. <laughs> well, I guess I'm not, I'm up next, and uh, I'll try to kind of hurry through this. Uh, I guess so, uh, about my grandma. What? I get back on schedule here, since Pete took a lot of time. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm John Fredericks Jr., and I'm a member of the three affiliated tribes here. I grew up on the reservation and uh, ranch all my life in the Twin Buttes area and some in the West area, segment area. And uh, my Indian name was given to me by my clan father, Pete Coffey. It's uh, Iduba, which means he said, the best he could uh, explain was the shin of the buffalo. Some people just call it ankle. You know. But anyway, that was, that was the engine name I got. It came from my uh, uncle, Wilfred Medicine Stone, who was killed in action in World War II. So I kind of cherished the name because of that. <clears throat> when I was about 14 years old, I was on what we call the Big Lease Roundup Northwest of McGregor Camp. The Big Lease was leased and run by a few large non-Indian ranchers and was separated from the engine operators by a drift fence that had four wires. It went north and south, just west of my Uncle Jim Hall's ranch and on north by Spring Buttes and over into the Independence country. Now that I've sort of located us, I was repping for my dad, John Frederick Sr., with my sister, Bedeen. About this time, Alba Woods was having a fair and rodeo at the old fairgrounds that was located about one mile south of Alba Woods. So I told Bo, my sister, that I would take the cattle 
we picked up of my dad's and take them by the ranch, she would stay and finish the roundup and end up at Ag Kennedy's. She, she uh, knew the Ag Kennedy family real well and could, t could depend on them to take her horse uh, back home or wherever she wanted. She would stay and finish uh, as I was wanted to go to the fair and enter the rodeo. So I headed east, leading my horses and pushing the cows ahead past McGregor Camp and down Moccasin to my Uncle Jim Hall's camp and finally to my dad's ranch. My dad was pleased with my performance, so when I asked him if I would go to the fair, he said, go, to go ahead. I changed horses and headed for the fair about 20 mile, 21 miles east. I got in a bareback riding, I recall. The horse was wild and nervous, as I was. I called for the horse, and when they opened the gate, I was really going to make a showing for myself. I spurred at the horse's neck while he was still in the chute, and the horse ducked under my leg. Lucky for me, he gave me a time to regroup and get my leg back on the side of his neck so I could spur him out as he left the chute. It didn't do much good, however, because a few jumps out of there, he left me hanging in the air, and then to that good old sandy loam that flourished in our river bottoms. As I drug myself out of the dirt and brushed my jeans off, I could hear the band playing. It sort of made me feel better. I had my first bareback bronc course behind me, and the band was playing even though I bucked off. The good part of it was I had a couple of uncles playing in the band, Charles Huber Sr. and Arthur Mandan, along with Floyd Montclair and others. Uh, the important thing was we had a, at the fair that we had a, a place for the band and we had a, our own band that, that played the music uh, and they'd done a good job. These early Events I just spoke about set the pace for me as a cowboy in professional rodeo as well as ranch cowboy when being a cowboy really meant something to those of us that were in, in it. Because being a ranching cowboy meant you had to get up at daylight, get on wild snorty horses on those cold fall mor uh, mornings. Even if they bucked, you were expected to take, them all out of, uh, take it all out of them by the time you rode in to camp that evening. Put up hay all summer with horses until the first snowfall. Then ride on roundups, even if it meant freezing your face, to get your cattle together so you could feed them the hay you put up during the summer. Now I want to talk about our own early day ranchers and why ranching was so successful on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. <clears throat> The year of 1934, our tribe adopted and accepted the Reorganization Act, which provided for a constitution that included a corporate structure or the ability to set up a corporation. Most of our Indian men folks were warriors that were used to hunting buffalo that were in abundance during that time and prior to that time to provide a total living for their families and rode good horses to protect their families against the enemy tribes that they fought in the early days. So the lifestyle of being a rancher and raising cattle with horses to do the work with our Indian men well, took to this new life. They elected a tribal council to run the government of the tribe and they got busy working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Together they secured a federal charter to do business on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. The three tribes involved to uh, were the three tribes that we that now are part of this reservation, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara. <clears throat> Together they talked the Bureau of Indian Affairs into providing them with an agent to work with them in developing and using their resources. Thus the Fort Berthold Livestock Association was born. After setting up the board of directors and getting their agent on board, they met with all the families of the reservation and decided with the assistance of their new agent, just how they were going to run things. At this point in our times, we, we sort of had a three-branch government. The Bureau of Indian Affairs provided the law and order, 
The council was our executive branch and our association was the, was the Congress, so to speak. Anyway, it worked real well for, for us at the time. Working together, our people established the following system through the use of their corporation. They set up a repayment program. Any male or female over the age of 18 could secure cattle in 10 head increments, provided they had a camp and hay for the cattle. I believe early on it was capped at 50 head. Back in those days, that was, pretty good. That was a pretty good bunch of cattle. <coughs> Many of our better ranchers increased their herds to 100 and better. Some contracted with large meat companies and ran yearlings in larger numbers. The best mother cows were purchased originally from this program, and with good bulls, our Indian ranches became noted for good cattle. 32 people and even bought bulls from them. Then we set up a bull program. The board of direct, the, the board and the agents purchased some very good bulls for their operators, which developed into some outstanding cow herds on the res reservation. The association purchased the bulls and kept them and fed them until it was time to put them out with the cows. So much per head was charged for the use of the bulls. No money changed hands. The Indian cattle had a big ID brand on, on the shoulder. Therefore, since they were considered government property, nobody bothered them. The board and the agent also purchased supplemental feed and salt in large increments for a cheaper price. All this was kept at the Elwood's agency headquarters. A flour and feed mill was also set up whereby the operators could bring in their wheat in, and get it processed so they would have flour for foodstuffs and bran for their calves. The Indian operators never paid cash for any of the above production costs. A record was kept at the headquarters office, and when they sold their calves, you brought your proceeds in and your, your yearly expenses were deducted and the balance was given back to the operator. <clears throat> the association members also set up a small loan program which provided for Indian family needs for out-of-the-pocket expenses during the year from one fall to the next. The loan was paid off the same way that other operating expenses were paid. When each operator sold his cattle in the fall, some operators sold locally uh, and some shipped to other central markets like Fargo, North Dakota, South St. Paul, Minnesota, and to Chicago, Illinois. I may have missed one or two, but those were the main markets during those good prosperous years for our livestock people on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. And I say good prosperous years because at that time that system provided uh, a good life for all of our, uh, our people on the reservation and all the people participated in it. I don't think there was a family that didn't. And they had uh, uh, pigs and chickens and other livestock, elk cows, to provide uh, uh, food stuff for the, for the family. And I don't want to, I'm talking about ranching, but I don't want to leave the women folks out. They worked very hard during those days. They put in uh, big gardens and together with their family, kept them clean and, and uh, canned all summer long. Not only from, from the garden, but also from the wild fruits and so forth we had in the area of the lowlands. <coughs> the association members also set up a small loan program which provided, for the, let's see, I think I covered that, okay. Uh, it had to be a good program because all the families participated. It provided a good life, taught our younger generation how to work and take on responsibility at an early age. Basically during that time we had no welfare. We had no drugs and very little alcoholism. We were living the good life off the resources our great spirit provided for us. We were happy. We loved each other and helped one another. We rode many miles to worship our great spirit and give him thanks for providing these things for us. Then came the Pick Sloan era. The dam was built at Pick City and backed water up the big and little Missouri rivers. Our timber was gone, our feed base, our water holes, our protection. And our Indian ranchers left their heart and soul to wither 
with, and die with all the resources and animals that the water from the dam destroyed. Some other ranchers tried to ranch on the upper bench lands they were forced to relocate to due to the Garrison Dam, but were not very successful in the, in the process. We lost our credit program that FHA, and, that, and FHA took over. We're now in court with the FHA trying to keep our land together. We lost our repayment program and our funds were generated from the bull program Superintendent Morgan gave to the Tribal Business Council without our authority. But most of all, we lost a great livelihood. Thank you. You know, I, I'm the youngest of the, of, of the family, and I just wanted to tell you that, you know, when I, when I grew up growing up, doing chores was riding about two steers and maybe a colt. And if they didn't get me hurt by that, then they'd, they'd put me on a buck and barrel and I'd ride that buck and barrel until they cut my head open or something. And that's, that's just, that was just like doing chores for me. Uh, and then when they were rodeoing hard, we'd be, we'd be up there working. And I remember Pete going in, fifth, in road gear on, on, when I was on the rake. And uh, he wanted to get done with his field because he wanted to go to a rodeo in Wolf Point. <laughs> and... Uh, he was going so damn fast that the rake came off and it stuck in the ground and I just went flying in the air. <laughs> so I walked home and told him, hell, I'm not riding no rake for you. <laughs> and then uh, one time we were rolling up hay in the hay field, Buzz, he came home. I don't know if he came home from a rodeo or a dance, but Sweet Holen was in the haystack and we were around there playing and hell he went to sleep when he was pulling the hay up and he pulled the hay all over on top of the no. top of the guy. <laughs> and then one time Pete, he came from, we were all haying, we were really doing good, we were just about done with the field and Pete, he come back, I guess he's feeling guilty because he wasn't helping hay and he was rodeo and he came into the field. In about 10 minutes he had the damn tractor on fire and he had uh, stuff burning and <laughs> My dad went over there and said, get the hell out of here. He said, you're a cowboy, you're not a, you're not a hay man. You shouldn't be riding a tractor. <laughs> but, uh, it was a lot of fun growing up on the ranch. Uh, as my brother stated, uh, we did a lot of work. Uh, I did a lot of the haying and I stayed home. Uh, my mother, I, I started rodeo and when I was when I graduated from the eighth grade, I won the high school bareback ride and qualified for the nationals. Uh, but my mother said she had enough cowboys. She didn't want, she didn't want me to be a cowboy. And so I went to college and, and, uh, and went into sports, and got a scholarship to play football. And then I went to law school and became a lawyer. Uh, Minot State, I graduated from in, law, in undergrad and I graduated from the University of Colorado law school, and I never left Colorado except to come home here. Uh, but I wanted to give you a little idea about what life was like. Uh, you know, I remember I was the youngest, so I was always the guy that was kind of taking care of things that, uh, like when we'd have a horse roundup, you know, they'd, they'd start out over here in the, what Buzz called the big lease. They were wild horses. And so they'd start them around across the river and they'd come up on the top out by Pete's place there at the end of the road in Twin Buttes. We were taking them to my dad's ranch. And these horses were wild and, and, uh, and our horses, their horses would be about played out by the time they got up on top of that coming out of Tunnel Point and down there on, the, what was that, uh, Martell Bottom. And, and they'd come out of the they'd come out of the breaks up on the divide there, and so I'd I'd be standing there holding a bunch of horses. I'd have a truckload of horses unloaded, and they'd take new horses. And I remember one time my cousin Wesley Hall, he was he was coming up there. His horse was all played out, so he he did. But I didn't have a horse for him, so he was just kind of playing around with me there. I had the truck and I was going to load the horses. But I thought, well, I'll jump on the back and take a ride with him. And I got us both bucked off. His horse had enough, enough going, to, so he bucked us off. 
But we took them horses all the way to my dad's place, uh, wild horses. I remember that one of the last roundups I think we had uh, of taking them horses into, uh, into the crowd. They're up into civilization. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, I'm uh, doing a lot of work on the Garrison Dam, uh, the taking, and the, uh, the, way, the way the government looked at our life is they tried to buy an acre of land and say that it, the, value, the value was whatever the market value was. They didn't look at the value of the, the actual way of life. On Fort Berthold, at the time of the taking in the 1940s, 85% of the tribe lived along the river. We were river people. 85% and all the allotments were along the river. And so at the time of the taking, and this is documented in our reports, 6% of the Indians were on welfare or some kind of public assistance. And uh, they all had family, like John said, they had family gardens, they had little cattle. Everybody was self-sufficient. And that was because, you know, we had wild plums, we had June berries, we had choke cherries, we had wild. I know right by our place in the, on the Little River, uh, where, my, where my folks lived, we had a little patch, it was just like an orchard. You know, we had all those fruits in there. And then we had wild grapes along the river. And if we wanted to get coal, we got on the ice and we'd go along the river until we found the coal seam that we wanted to, that my dad knew was pretty good coal, and we, that's where we got our coal. And uh, we got wood from the trees, and our cattle grazed in the river bottoms. It'd be windy, blowing, and they'd be fine. You know, just like it was just like a shed for them. That those trees. I know the people would come to my dad's ranch on the Little River, and they'd say, "John, you got a paradise for cattle here," and it was. It was a very, it was a very nice ranch, and I never realized what happened to my dad because he got up to the when they when they flooded the uh, Missouri, he went. He didn't really have his heart in ranching anymore. He was depressed. I didn't know he was depressed, but I just wondered what was wrong with him. But now, as I studied it, I understand. <coughs> but uh, ranching then got much more difficult. But and and when the Army Corps of Engineers took our property, you know they the, the United States valued it as, a, as what you would sell a, a piece of property. They didn't value all these other things that were valued: the wild animals that we lived off, the game that we the the subsistence that was provided by the by the uh, terrain and the and the climate of, of being by the river. Uh, I got five minutes. You guys took all my time. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, what we're trying to do now is, you know, we, we've, we've progressed. You know, we had a little guy that valued our property. Buzz talked about the tribal council. We didn't have big experts. We didn't have lawyers like myself. We had, our people did the best they could, and they negotiated a pretty good contract. They got power in there. They were, when, after the taking, they, they were supposed to have a block of power. But, and, the, and the act said that the secretary and the, and the tribe would negotiate a contract, and we did. And they negotiated a pretty, and I have a copy of that contract. But it went to the Congress, and Congress just wiped everything out and did whatever they wanted. And we ended up with, I think, about 12 million. That's all on the PowerPoint, but I don't have time to do my PowerPoint. Uh, about 12 million dollars. And uh, today, we valued that and we used experts, and we got the, the way it should be valued. And there's two kind of two school of thoughts, is how much can you earn from an acre of land by putting efforts into it? And then the other way is to value it on what, what it costs to live. You know, if you lived off coal and wood, then you move up to the top, and there's no wood, no coal, then you have to buy propane. So there's a consumer kind of aspect to it. What does it cost you now to live? It's a hell of a lot more to have uh, elect electric heat and propane and that kind of stuff. So that really impacted our tribe. 
And when we studied the, studied the tribe in 1992, when we passed the JTAC law, 94% uh, 90, of our people were on some form of public assistance. So that ought to tell you the kind of impact that the Garrison Dam had on the, on the Fort Berthel Reservation. So we went from 6% public assistance to 94% public, public, some kind of public help. So we hired experts. We hired an economist out of New Mexico. We hired an economist out of uh, that graduated from uh, Cornell, and uh, we valued these. Now the uh, the, the JTAC uh, was a group that was appointed by the United States to represent the United States, and they they found that we did not get just compensation for our bottomlands. So we studied it. Remember, they gave us twelve thousand dollars. And so they studied it, and they came up with a number of 182 million for the low side, using the New Mexico, where you earn what you can earn from the land, and the the Cornell economists who who valued it as what you lost, how how it cost you to per, for as a consumer, and also what all the the wild animals, all everything you lost from from a, li a way of life. And that came up to 411 million. Well, Congress said, you know, they, they said, well, we don't know if this is right. The, the Secretary of the Interior disagreed with their, his own JTAC committee that he had appointed. And so he, he sent it on to Congress, and then Congress enacted a bill where they gave it to the GAO, the General Accounting Office, to look at it. And they said, well, they've overstated their, uh, their amount, so. We, what what we should do is remember the tribal council hired a little uh, appraiser that probably from partial or from garrison or minot or someplace that appraised the land down here, and he came up with twenty about twenty two million or twenty three million, and so the GAO said, well we think that's overstated. They were willing to take twenty three million back when in nineteen forty nine. When they had no money, they had nothing to hire an expert with. So let's just give them the difference between the 23 million that they said they were entitled to back in 47 and what we paid them. And then they took the uh, corporate bond rate and, and present valued it up to the present day. And that came to 149 million. And now uh, they valued, they went to to, uh, and there's a lot of this kind of going on now, the river, 23% of the land that was lost as, as a result of the Pick Stone, Sloan program was Indian land. And there were eight dams on the, re on the river, and so there's eight tribes that were flooded out. By, and, and the reason for that is Congress, it was easy for the United States to take Indian land because it was in the name of the United States. It was underdeveloped. They thought it was cheaper, but it had a crippling effect on the on the on the Indians. And now Senator McCain, he's saying, uh, you know, they 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 went to Cheyenne River, and Cheyenne River got a value that we all claim is the is the right way to value the land, to value what we lost as Indians. And that came to 290 million, and they lost 104,000 acres. Well, the economist that did that is Robert McLaughlin, and, and he's, the, he's the guy that uh, valued Standing Rock, and he valued uh, Cheyenne River. Well, they finally, GAO went along with Bob McLaughlin's uh, economics, and so they, uh, they passed the JTAC bill at, at Cheyenne River for $290 million. So that means that our if we get parity with that at Fort Berthold, we should get 411 million in, back in 1992, which is going to be a lot more today. We're thinking maybe a billion dollars. John McCain is saying, "How come you guys keep coming back here? I mean, how, how many times are you going to get your head in the trough?" He said at the last hearing. Well, we're we're coming back because we're entitled to just compensation. When you get when you get land taken for a public purpose and it's private land you're supposed to be able to get just compensation 
And, and so that's the argument that we're saying, we didn't get just compensation, your own people. And, and Congress said we didn't get just compensation. They said that in their findings in the JTAC law. So we've got a big fight going on, and, and John is head of a group we call the Upper Missouri River uh, Allottees Association, which is, and, and when Congress passed this 149 million, 90% of the land that was lost was allotted land meaning individual land, and they gave the 149 million to the, to the tribe instead of to the, to the allottees. So that's the fight we're at now. We got, and so we're, you know, we don't want to be fighting between the tribes. Be, so we're saying to the tribe, you keep the 149, we're going to go after the 411. <laughs> so, uh, so that's kind of where we're at. And I know our time is up, but I just wanted, I had a, a pictorial, I wanted to show you how we lived back when, but That'll be another day, I guess. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Well, they gave us a wealth of information. And unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions. But hopefully, if you do have any questions for Tom, Pete, and John, they can answer them at the back of the Tom V. And here in about five minutes, we're going to have Harry Beauchamp and Harry Beauchamp III speaking about Assiniboine culture and history. Thank you very much. <laughs>